Hello everyone. There has been a lot of curiosity about the Hava satiety score. How does it work? And perhaps even more important, why is this approach helpful? Well, today we're answering some of these questions and we're diving into the fascinating world of satiety and how we can use science to help us feel full and satisfied while automatically consuming fewer calories in the process. You see, Everyone eats to satiety, but the question is, how many calories did it take to get there? Enter the concept of satiety per calorie, or the amount of satiety a food provides, divided by the caloric content of that food. Now, there are a number of factors that are evidence-based to improve satiety per calorie, and there are a number of factors that are evidence-based to worsen satiety per calorie. In general, anything that increases the protein, fiber, water, weight, volume, and surface hardness of the food tends to improve satiety per calorie. And then anything that increases the refinement of non-protein energy calories, which is essentially non-fiber carbohydrate, fat, and alcohol, tends to lower the overall satiety per calorie. In addition to refined carbs and fats, other factors such as salt and sugar tend to make food tastier and more palatable, leading to overeating beyond satiety. This hyperpalatability greatly worsens satiety per calorie. Now, the Hava satiety score approach is based on our satiety per calorie algorithm, which considers four of the largest factors that are evidence-based to improve satiety per calorie. Number one, protein percent of calories. Number two, fiber grams per 1,000 calories. Number three, energy density of food. And finally, number four, hedonic scoring. Let's break down each of these primary factors and see how they can be used to create a diet that optimizes body composition and metabolic health by allowing us to eat to satiety without overeating calories. First up, protein percentage. Thankfully, there are a number of studies and meta-analyses that shed light on the association between dietary protein percentage and spontaneous caloric intake. Here is a prominent meta-analysis of human randomized controlled trials that shows a clear dose-response curve between protein intake and overall caloric consumption. Within the typical human range of 10 to 30% protein calories, there's significant protein leverage or higher satiety from higher protein percentage. Within this range, for every additional calorie from protein, people tend to consume about 10 fewer calories from carbs and fats. The most noticeable effect is seen between 10 and 20% protein with diminishing returns beyond that. As it turns out, this sort of dose response curve has a shape that is fairly classic when it comes to describing the relationship between many nutrients and outcomes. The data from this meta-analysis, as well as data from a number of other human randomized controlled trials, allows us to create a nutrient dose response curve from which we can extrapolate how certain foods might increase or decrease caloric intake based on the protein percentage of that food. Protein emerges as one of the most powerful factors when it comes to eating fewer calories, which is probably why all of the impressive low carb diet study results involve higher protein percentages as well. And why all of your bodybuilders and aesthetic athletes are consuming very high protein diets when their goal is fat loss. Next up is fiber. Let's talk about fiber. Fiber adds bulk to our diets, slows digestion, and promotes a feeling of fullness. The overall satiety effect of fiber is well recognized. Foods high in fiber, particularly those with soluble fiber, tend to help maintain satiety longer due to their slower digestion and impact on gut hormones related to hunger. Meta-analyses reveal that increasing fiber intake helps reduce overall caloric consumption. However, like protein, the benefits show diminishing returns beyond a certain point. The key is to incorporate a variety of fiber-rich foods to maximize these benefits within the natural range of human intakes. Fiber is a smaller contributor compared to protein percentage, and there is less evidence here from which to construct a dose response curve. This is further complicated by the fact that there are different types of fiber with slightly different effects. Soluble fiber, for example, seems to have slightly higher satiety per calorie than insoluble fiber because soluble fiber forms a gel-like substance in the gut, slowing digestion and increasing feelings of fullness. 
However, we do have a number of meta-analyses on fiber in general. And if you look at the entire body of evidence on fiber, it is clear that there is a small reduction in energy intake as the grams of fiber, usually reported as grams of fiber per 1000 calories, goes up. Higher fiber diets can improve satiety per calorie, even if protein percent is lower. And this explains many successful low fat dietary approaches, even with lower protein percentages, such as plant-based diets. Next, let's talk about energy density. Energy density or the calories per gram of food is another critical factor and arguably the factor with the very strongest evidence base. There are dozens of studies showing that humans spontaneously eat more calories with higher energy density foods and fewer calories with lower energy density foods. In fact, humans tend to eat the same weight and volume of food somewhat independent of the actual number of calories contained in that food. This means that targeting lower caloric density foods allows you to eat to satiety while still consuming less calories. Lower energy density foods help people eat fewer calories overall because foods with higher water and fiber content, such as fruits and vegetables, take up more space in the stomach and take longer to digest, promoting satiety. As you can see from this meta-analysis, the dose response curve to energy density is at times quite linear and is in fact the strongest and most predictable of any of these four factors. Similar to other nutrients, however, looking at all available data shows that the curve is really not linear throughout the range of human dietary intakes. The dose response curve shows a linear relationship up to about 1.75 kcals per gram with diminishing returns beyond this point. Again, creating the sort of S-shaped curve with a linear region, but diminishing returns thereafter. Energy density is incredibly powerful. And the reason that fruits and vegetables are statistically so beneficial for fat loss dieting is likely due to the inherently low energy density of these foods. Finally, we have the hedonic factor, which can often be the strongest driver of caloric consumption, but at the same time is certainly the most challenging to quantify. Hedonics are a combination of qualities that, together, sum up the palatability and pleasure derived from eating. Hedonics are driven by the combination of fats, sugars, and salts often found in ultra-processed foods. There is some overlap here with the other factors that we have already discussed, as frequently highly hedonic foods are also lower in protein and fiber, while being higher in energy density. Studies indicate that people consume more calories from hyperpalatable foods, such as salted nuts or sweetened snacks, compared to their less processed counterparts. While this area has less concrete research, it's evident that reducing hyperpalatable ultra-processed foods can help control overeating. We have more research here on non-human animals than we do in humans, as many research scientists have placed a lot of effort into creating obesogenic rodent chow designed to create obesity and type 2 diabetes in lab animals as quickly and easily as possible. These models are very helpful for medical research given today's global obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics. As it turns out, one of the fastest ways to fatten a lab animal is to feed it human junk food. Economic forces have perfectly evolved human junk food to have the very highest hedonics and the very lowest satiety per calorie. We at HAVA have used all available evidence to create a dose response curve for factors like salt and sugar and combinations of high energy density carbs and fats together that seem to drive maximum ad lib or as much as you want caloric consumption. We have several meta-analyses that combine human randomized trials comparing macronutrient composition and ad lib caloric consumption and it is quite evidence that highest consumption occurs with a combination of carbs and fats together. Think pizza, donuts, candy bars, cookies, and anything else that seems super tasty and addictive. These combinations are rarely found in nature and are highly rewarding from a brain chemistry point of view, which makes sense from an evolutionary survival point, as starvation has been a threat for millions of years, while obesity has only been a problem for a few hundred. Our entire biology is wired to eat as many calories as possible, so it's no wonder that hedonic forces are extremely powerful when it comes to caloric intake.
Now, how do we combine these factors? Our satiety per calorie algorithm combines these four factors, protein percent, fiber fraction, energy density, and hedonics to help guide food choices. By focusing on foods that are higher in protein and fiber while being lower in energy density and hedonic factors, we can create a diet that allows for eating to satiety while easily and naturally reducing caloric intake without hunger or deprivation. But how exactly do we combine these factors together? There are a few existing studies that combine these factors and look at overall caloric consumption, and directionally all of these factors do seem to be additive together in a fairly straightforward fashion. But in fairness, the studies that we need to know exactly how to combine all of these factors together don't yet exist. And because funding for this sort of research is sadly very poor, it will be a long time before we have exact data for how all of these factors combine in every possible permutation. But the beauty of the Hava algorithm is that it is created using the best available current evidence, and if and when better studies are released with even more exact data, we will be able to easily incorporate those studies and that data into our algorithm in the sort of self-learning, continual improvement iterations that are central to most machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we welcome all additional data that will help to inform the algorithm going forward. And since the perfect study will probably never exist, we are moving forward with all available evidence so far, which is quite a lot and more than good enough to get started. And now let's talk about why anyone would want to use this multifaceted dietary approach at all. The answer is simply that unifocal approaches that only focus on one component inevitably fail to explain everything that happens in nutrition. For example, low carb diets work quite well. So why not just focus on carbohydrate intake? Well, the first answer is that low fat diets work almost as well. How can you explain the success of low fat dieting if carbohydrate restriction is the only tool in your toolbox? And then the second answer is that carbohydrate restriction only works when you pay attention to the other factors anyway. Picture a low carb diet that is also low in protein and high in energy density. This would be something like nuts and nut butters, heavy cream, other high fat dairy, oils and refined fats. While this would be partially effective as it would eliminate a lot of hedonic foods that require both carbs and fats together to be hyper palatable, if you added some artificial sweeteners to this diet and made a bunch of super tasty keto cookies or something, I don't know how successful this diet would be in the long run. So even if your dietary approach is unifocal, such as low fat or low carb, you are still better off paying attention to other factors, such as protein percentage, fiber, energy density, and hedonics. In other words, the components of the HAVA satiety score are still there in the background, working their magic, no matter if you choose to pay attention to them or not. To wrap this up, the satiety per calorie algorithm is a powerful tool for better eating. By understanding and applying these principles, you can enjoy satisfying meals while effortlessly achieving your health and weight goals. Remember, it's not just about eating less, it's about eating better. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more tips on high satiety eating. Hey, I'm Ava. Do you wanna start eating better, not just less? The Hava app uses the satiety per calorie algorithm to help you balance all of the factors with our satiety score so you can enjoy satisfying meals while reaching your health goals. Download the Hava app for free and let it guide you towards smarter, more fulfilling eating. See you there.